Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth, where I talk to artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals. Uh, today, I have a very special guest, Alex Nye. He's a return guest to the pod and a friend of the pod, for sure. So, yeah, man, thanks for coming on. Uh, so excited to be here. Yeah, it feels like just yesterday that we recorded that last one. I can't believe it's already been, what, a couple of years? That's yeah. wild. Yeah, because it, it's really lot. been it's been like almost a year and a half since I put out an episode. So, which oh, is wow, okay, yeah. little hiatus. Yep, yep. Well, I'm glad to glad to see you're back at it. I love the series, man. Thank you, appreciate it. Like me, you have your hands in a lot, um, <laughs> you know. So I guess a good bucket term of what you are is an, is just an artist. If you want to get a little more specific, you do focus on photography a lot. But I know you're also big into video. You're into fine mm-hmm. art prints. And you're an American Ninja Warrior. Yes. Yeah, it is kind of hard to keep track uh, of all the identities. Uh, and it, it makes it kind of interesting, you know, when I'm like meeting new people or, you know, talking to people in different industries or like clients even. Yeah, a lot's going on, man. Always juggling a, a, a few different balls. But that's what makes life exciting, man. We covered a lot of stuff in the first episode. And so if you're listening to this and you want to know more about Alex's bio, um, you can definitely go check out that first episode. Um, But um, since then, I mean, it seems like you're still definitely pretty heavily focused on architectural photography and and those big packages. My career has always been kind of figuring out how to combine my passions and the things that I'm, you know, most interested in photographing and capturing uh, and apply that to a commercial realm uh, and how to actually turn that into clients and, and profit and whatnot. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'm most passionate about in my personal work is time lapse, like you mentioned. Uh, and what's cool is for the longest time, I was always doing time lapses just for the love of it, right? You know, I obsessively shoot, experiment, post, share my work. Um, and get feedback on it. And what's cool is that, you know, doing that, uh, those personal projects has really led to a lot of different client projects and, uh, and paid work. Um, in the commercial space, I'm really involved in the architectural industry, what's called AEC, architecture, engineering, and construction, uh, basically the building industry, right? Um, and so there's tons of applications for what I do, uh, both drone photography and also time-lapse. And so, you know, a few of my clients are developers or construction companies, uh, where, I mean, I do a whole variety of things, but, but one thing that you alluded to is these long-term time-lapses. So, you know, these construction projects take two to five years in some cases, uh, from start, from start to finish. And, you know, I've kind of developed a service where I uh, leave a long-term time-lapse in this, you know, weatherproof housing, self-powered with a solar panel. Uh, and, you know, I have remote eyes on it so I can kind of check up on it uh, on a daily basis, which I get pretty obsessive over. Uh, but uh, that's really, really cool uh, and exciting. I, I, didn't know. I didn't know you could actually access it remotely. I thought it was just one of those things where you set it and pray that in two oh, years. <laughs> well, thank goodness that I, I can see it live um, or like the most recent photos because it's on a cellular data plan. So, you know, basically I pay AT&T a monthly bill, just like you would a cell phone. Uh, yeah. And it, you know, you get like five gigabytes uh, to upload photos to the cloud. And there's like this web platform. So both myself and my client can see the most recent photos uh, and and it's a good thing too because you know I've run into a bunch of um, errors <laughs> with the system, especially in Southern California. Here recently, we've had these crazy like rare rainstorms, like like we've never seen, and and that really screwed me up. Not only my long term time lapse housing, but also my car, which is a whole other story <laughs> that we probably shouldn't get into, uh, but. Yeah, I noticed, you know, this time-lapse housing had some moisture in it, which it's really not supposed to. Um, And and so it was like fogging up the front lens, which basically made the shot, you know, unusable. And and so that, thank goodness I caught that early and, you know, visited the site, uh, checked up on it, cleaned it out, dried it out. Um, 
But, you know, even that's kind of a pain because it's on a rooftop of another business that I need to coordinate with maintenance people and get access to. Uh, so it's not like I, you know, it's not that easy because uh, it has to be out of reach, right? It can't be easily accessible for some person to just stumble on it and mess with it. Um, but then of course there's like, what tripod do you use? How much do you weight it down? Um, you know, I had a bunch of comments online, like, you're not going to strap that thing down. Like, what about, you know, torrential winds or whatever, uh, which we don't really get here, but, um, from what I've seen, you know, studying the images, uh, from beginning to end, like it barely moves at all. Like maybe a pixel it shifted, but I'm, I'm pretty, pretty comfortable in that, that sense. Is it spitting out JPEGs or is it the raw or both? Yeah, no, good question. So it does both. The the essentially the JPEGs are used for the the quick upload, the client, right? Yeah. So that's what's uploaded to the cloud for me to see. Uh, but then it has an onboard SSD. I am also kind of curious about like the frequency of um, you know, how often the photos being taken and what the end goal is. Um, you know, in two years, five years, whatever. And then um, also um, just escape my brain, but basically I want to know more about the specific, oh, basically like, did you develop a system or you learned this like on YouTube or something like that? All great questions. Uh, no, I cannot take credit. I wish I could. Uh, I'm not that uh, much of a tech engineer, but it, it, the system came from a company called Photo Sentinel. Uh, they're actually based in Australia and they're from based on my research, they're like the best option that's out there as far as long-term time lapses. There's, there's a bunch of others that are a little cheaper, maybe a little simpler or smaller. Um, but for just like top of the line quality and every feature, you know, you, you would want, uh, this is kind of the system you'd go with. It's pretty pricey. Like the the box, the housing itself costs between six to eight thousand. And then you know you need to put a camera in there. That's another three four thousand camera with a, a wide angle lens. Uh, depending how nice you go with that. Um, and then of course the monthly fee, which is like one hundred and ten dollars a month. So that really adds up. Which is you know also why it's it's tough to find clients who are willing to pay for it like i've pitched this to many of my clients um a very small number of them have actually gone for it um and so yeah it's you know it's expensive like the client has to pay minimum a thousand dollars a month or more uh depending on how long their total duration is but yeah as far as the settings um so for one you know you want the camera in aperture priority uh, and then I, I sort of lock it somewhere around F 6.3 to F eight. Um, you know, you don't want it too small, uh, of an aperture because then it, you know, it might start picking up dust on that front glass element, uh, because of the, you know, the wider or the more deep, deeper, a less <laughs> shallow depth of field. Yeah. The less shallow, I guess it's deeper, deeper depth yeah, of field. I think so. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, aperture priority. Uh, and then, you know, it just so your uses... apertures, apertures locked and your shutter speed is fluctuating. Exactly. Apertures locked. ISO is locked at 100. So the only thing changing is shutter speed. Uh, and the camera automatically deals with that. And the intervals are so far apart that it doesn't matter if it needs to do like a 15 or 30 second exposure. Like, I, I don't really care if, if it needs to do that, but it would rarely, rarely do that anyway, because it's not shooting at night, you know, it's, it's shooting during the day. Um, and so the interval is every, I mean, they recommend somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, I used to do 15 minutes. Now I'm actually doing every 10 minutes. Um, and so, you know, you do the math, you get six photos an hour, it's shooting for eight hours, whatever, 42, 42 shots a day or something. <laughs> Testing my math and, right now. And not at night? No. So that's the thing you can program, uh, not only time of day, but also days of the week. So mine is programmed to only shoot from Monday to Friday, uh, about, you know, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And that's pretty standard construction hours. But then you also want to be in contact with the project manager 
uh, who's on site. And so they can update you if there's like any big milestones or special events happening uh, because, you know, a, a concrete pour or some like, crane action, because in that case, you would want to change the interval to be something a little faster, you know, to capture like that, that unique event that's happening one day. Um, so that, that will happen occasionally. I'll change the settings. So doesn't that uh, kind of compress and and stretch your, your finished product as far as the time of the actual, you know, how do I, how do I word that? Basically, if you're shooting more photos, right. that section's going to take up yeah. a longer part of the finished product. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. And, and so that's where at the very end of the process, which, you know, it's hard to think that far ahead, but that's two or three years down the line. Um, that's where that work will come in, uh, basically culling through hundreds or thousands of images. Um, and, you know, it's not perfect. Like there's some, sometimes it'll, it'll shoot, you know, too early in the morning or too late in the evening where there's not no action happening, or maybe, you know, maybe they take a day off of construction and I didn't, I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, so there's entire days that are nothing happening. Um, so that's where the more tedious work comes in of kind of going, you know, putting it all out in a timeline, going day by day, frame by frame, and kind of picking, picking out the things that are not helpful to the story, uh, nothing changing. Uh, and then, you know, kind of emphasizing or speeding up or slowing down the areas that you want to emphasize. So yeah, it would take, uh, some time in post. And then of course, you know, you, you need to do some frame blending tricks. There's a few different ways to do it. Um, but just so it's, it feels a little more smooth because if you're going day by day and the weather is really choppy, for example, like say one day is sunny, the next day is like overcast or as partial clouds. Um, you know, that looks kind of funny, uh, in the, in a video that's going so fast because it, it's like all of a sudden it's, you know, well lit and then gray skies. Uh, and so that can be, be kind of jarring and like it creates this flicker effect. Uh, so there's ways that you can kind of blend those frames together. So like a few days might kind of overlap in opacity so that it, it's a little smoother transitions. Um, but yeah, that's, that kind of all happens at the end. I don't really concern myself with that. Um, unless a client wanted it, I wouldn't usually do like partial updates. Like I could, of course, do, hey, here's a progress of the first year or the past month or something. Um, but, you know, you'd have to charge extra for that. For, you know, the basic package is just, hey, wait, wait till the end. And then I'll, I'll put one, you know, really well polished video together. Very cool. Yeah. So it's kind of like faking mo uh, motion blur in a way by... Sort of laying yeah. different frames. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, um, so if, yeah, you're, if you're, if you're in a time-lapse photography at all, it's like when you're first starting out and you shoot with too fast of a shutter speed, which is why people use a UV filter on their camera to, so they can actually slow the shutter speed down. So people or cars or whatever, aren't <laughs> jumping all over the place in the mm -hmm. middle of the day and creating yeah. that kind of jarring right. look. So exactly. And it makes a, it makes a huge difference. You know, I, I, I didn't always take that seriously either, you know, until I like, experimented more and learned more about time lapse. Um, but you're right. It, it makes such a big difference to have some blur because otherwise it just feels kind of chop, choppy and abrupt, but you can't really do that for these construction time lapses because um, well, for one, the client might want to use individual photos that aren't like super blurred. So you don't necessarily want to see the equipment, you know, totally blurred out. Like they might want to use a still that's nice and sharp. Um, so yeah, that's why you would do it artificially in post. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting that that's like one little vertical of the creative realm that you could go in on and focus in on. Um, have you found anything in your business? And last time we talked a lot about licensing, but have you found anything in your business where you didn't think it was going to be maybe the most profitable or the most rewarding maybe uh, for yourself? And it, you're really surprised and you're like, oh, I should do more of this. And then you kind of follow that, mm. uh, that trail. Discovering architectural photography was kind of the first version of that, of what you're describing. Because, you know, when I first moved to California and I was trying to make a living with a camera, right? Um, I had been shooting for years 
Um, but everything I did was kind of personal work. It was just, you know, passion. It was the landscape. It was cityscape in, in Albany. Um, and, you know, I, I, I knew I loved it. I knew I was good at it, but I didn't really know how to apply it to a commercial realm. Um, and I think that was the the first big light bulb moment for me was when I actually watched a, a presentation at my local camera club uh, by a professional architectural photographer. And there was this, this big realization. I was like, wow, that is a discipline within photography. I didn't even really realize that. You know, there's so many little niches within the broader genre of photography. And, and it was like this, this perfect um, correlation that fit with my style of work. And I was already, you know, photographing architecture just for fun. Um, you know, I had learned a lot about Photoshop and retouching. And so those were skills that came in, you know, come in really handy for that type of work. And so that was like the first big realization is, Hey, you know, here's another Avenue that I can take my work. Uh, and, and the thing that I've been practicing and love to do and actually apply it to an industry that needs that service, you know, and needs, needs what I do. Um, so that was, I mean, that's the first really big example, I think, of just discovering, uh, architectural photography and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an immediate transition like it took from that point it took probably a year and a half or two years before i was actually getting hired uh the rest of the time was building a portfolio assisting you know another established photographer so that was an invaluable experience i think we may have may have touched on that before um and then yeah just marketing and and finally getting my own gigs um but yeah so there's you know there's I think that's the biggest thing when you're starting out is like, first, you got to discover what, what you enjoy shooting the most uh, and practice that, you know, become good at it. And then, you know, you got to kind of make those connections. You say, all right, what do I like shooting? Uh, and then find the the closest thing that applies to that. Uh, you know, in my case, it was architecture. For some people, it might be fashion or, you know, portraits or weddings um, or whatever, but yeah, so I think that's that was the the first hurdle is figuring out, you know, how can I apply my skills to an actual industry that needs it? Um, and then, of course, the time lapse, the construction, drone, you know, those were big realizations. Um, and then you also mentioned licensing. That was an, an area that uh, took me a long time to really wrap my head around and, and learn about and appreciate. But that, you know, that was a huge kind of wake up moment as well. You know, once I was photographing projects for, for my primary client, you know, in, in the realm of architecture, there's all these other parties that would also want those images. And so, you know, I started to uh, license out work to those other companies and kind of get residual income from the work that I'd already created. And what's cool about that is a lot of licensing opportunities come down to um, how much, you know, kind of research you want to put into it uh, because I, I'm guaranteed like most photographers are sitting on content, images, video, whatever, that is valuable to someone. You just have to kind of be creative and think about who would want, you know, would find value in this, who would pay for it. Uh, whether it's a, a developer or a company or a real estate agent um, or a tourism board, you know, like we've talked about. And so it's kind of making those connections and, and thinking about, um, how, you know, who, what, what organization or entity could find value in, in the work I create. And then, of course, it's like doing the research to find out who the right person to talk to is at that company, sending the cold emails, um, you know, pitching yourself to them. So, you know, if times are really slow and I'm not getting a lot of commissioned work, I could kind of just go into my archives, um, you know, look at look at some old buildings I shot uh, and just start sending emails and and generate some passive income 
well, I say passive, but it is, it is effort. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's not tied to necessarily time though. It's something you could right. sell. I remember something you said last time is that you'll actually just go to that big board they put at every construction site and you'll mm-hmm. figure who did the landscaping, right. you know, maybe it's good for the landscaping company. And exactly. Yeah, it's, a, it's a really smart way to, I mean, and you, you own the rights to the, the creative, so you can, you can license it out to multiple people mm-hmm. you know, d- depending on the terms of right. If you're right. shooting on spec, of course. Yes. Uh, which, you know, when I was first starting, that's how I got my foot in the door. And I may have mentioned this last time, but, you know, before you're getting commissioned, uh, you need to kind of get your work in front of people and you can't, it's really hard to just say, Hey, look at my portfolio, you know, hire me for your next job. Instead in, in the realm of architecture, it's great. Um, because you can just, you know, pay attention to what's going on in, in your neighborhood, photograph a building that's that's recently completed or, or nearing completion, take awesome photos, send it off, and they'll they'll say, wow, okay, the work is already done. We don't need to go hire a photographer. Um, so that's how I, I really got my foot in the door. Um, but you mentioned licensing and copyright. So that's something I've learned, you know, especially more recently um, to be careful of is there's oftentimes sneaky contracts or sneaky, you know, clients who are trying to uh, essentially swipe the copyright from out under you and, and take it for themselves, which uh, is pretty much, you know, it, for me, I don't, I don't, I try to avoid at all costs, right? I don't, I don't want to ever give away the copyright because that's like the most valuable thing we have. At, you know, the photography is my currency giving away the copyright is like giving away that, that currency. I can no longer do anything I want. You know, I can't sell it. Um, you know, in some cases I can't even use it on my own portfolio, which I've ran into. Uh, and I actually lost a client over that, a client, a big client who was trying to get unlimited, um, not, uh, not even unlimited exclusive rights to, to my work to the point where I wouldn't even be able to, to share it or use it for myself. And, uh, basically we had to go our separate ways. I tried to negotiate, but it didn't quite work. On the opposite end of the spectrum, is there stuff that you wish, I mean, other than the long-term time lapses, um, is there stuff that you wish, um, people wanted more? And the thing that pops to mind is like the FPV drone looks really fun, but like maybe hard to sell. What's your experience been with that? And is there other stuff that you kind of wish would, you know, take off more? No mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's tricky because, well, there's, there's layers, there's layers to, to how to answer that. So for FPV, um, that's something that surprisingly has become so popular these days and almost like a little overdone. Uh, and now it's like, it feels like everybody is kind of an FPV pilot in the, in the industry. And so, you know, I've been flying drones for over a decade. Uh, so I picked up on it, you know, fairly quick, but there's still more nuance to FPV than just flying a a typical GPS drone, um, especially in like manual or acro mode. So it's, it's much more advanced and, you know, I'm not nearly to the level of doing like backflips and corkscrews or whatever uh, with these drones. But what I find is those, you know, that, that next level of FPV piloting or like racing or whatever, it's not really applicable to my business. Um, I don't really have a need to do like fancy acrobatics. Uh, But what I do have is a need for like, extensive building tours right and so what i see what i saw it as fpv and the reason i wanted to incorporate it into my business is because i saw you know i saw it as a new tool uh a new outlet to feature and highlight my clients work their their buildings their architecture in a you know a new innovative way so instead of you know a traditional video where you get a couple drone shots a couple ground or gimbal shots and then kind of edit them together you know now we have this tiny little drone uh that can pretty much go in any tight space you can imagine and so it's really cool 
uh, to film these like one take continuous videos that, you know, start on the outside, establish the scene, the building, fly right into the front door, you know, through all the classrooms or whatever it is. Uh, and then, you know, do like a one take tour. So that's, you know, that's become a little popular, uh, in the industry, but, but it's also something that, you know, clients haven't fully grasped onto yet. Um, and so I think just showing them, you know, what's capable, um, and, you know, and kind of clumping that together with other types of services. So like if I'm hired to do photography, you know, I could pitch that as a, as an add on. Um, but to answer your question more directly, because I went on a little bit of a tangent on FPV, but the thing that I, I would love to do more of, and I would be really cool to be hired more for is the thing that I think I, what really had me discover a passion for photography from the beginning, which is my 4d photography series. So uh, for those who don't know, it's sort of this time blended images where I'll, I'll recreate the same photo, you know, at different times of day, day and night, whatever it is, different seasons in some cases, um, and blend those together into like one surreal image that, that shows this transition of time. Um, I've done that a handful of times for clients when photographing one of their buildings, uh, and I, I'll just sort of do it as an extra bonus and say, hey, check this out. And a lot of my clients love it. But the thing is, you know, most architects need this full, complete body of work where, you know, they've got the standard interiors, they got the exterior elevations, the drone shots. And so, you know, usually those 4D images are part of a larger package. Um, and, and I just sort of throw it in there as an add-on and, and a little extra, um, you know, personalized touch that, that many other people aren't doing. But it's rare that I would be commissioned, like specifically just to make a 4D hero shot, uh, and that would be really cool. And that's kind of what I, what I wanted or was hoping for when I was first getting into the industry. I was like, I would love it if I was the 4d guy, the hero shot guy, you know, call me just for your epic hero shot. Cause that was like my specialty. And I have done it a few times. Like I have had a couple clients that, that just need that, but usually you're kind of tying it into a larger package. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I just love pushing my own creative boundaries. Um, and so like experimenting with new techniques or, you know, the drone hyperlapse has been something that I've been obsessing with over the years. Um, and so, you know, I would love to to be hired more just to create these like really unique uh, drone shots, hyperlapses, time blends. Um, and I think one industry that you're obviously familiar with that I think that could be directly applicable to is tourism, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of times it's more than featuring one specific building. Um, usually it's like a landscape or a cityscape that, that I feel like I'm, I'm best at and that, you know, the, the technique or the process, uh, highlights those things really well. Um, and so I think that would be a cool application that I would love to get more involved with. I love that. I mean, multitasking is part of your business strategy, but also anytime you're out on a shoot, you got three, you got your wide angle, you got your telephoto you got the drone up in the air. And if you're not, you know, actively doing something, you're working out, like you're walking down some stairs on your hands or whatever, you know, doing backflips off of stuff. So like, you're definitely highly yeah. effective in, in your production process. Yeah, um, thank you, man. So, and, and you, and I love that you still find time to go out and do stuff on spec. So, which leads me to my next point last mm -hmm. year, you kind of popped, you, you, you had a, a piece uh, go mega, mega viral. Um, and if you're listening to this, uh, definitely go check out Alex's uh, YouTube channel. Cause he's got a, like a 15, 20 minute long document documentary about the uh, mini documentary about the whole process. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like why you were there that day? Uh, you know, the whole kind of story, except, uh, you know, you don't, you can, there, there might be some overlap with the documentary, but kind of give right. us some context here. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, that was just a, a fascinating experience um, overall, just really interesting learning experience as a creator, you know, as someone who puts out content, 
um, because you know, it was the, by far the most viral I've ever gone. Uh, it, you know, the first day it had a million views and then for a month straight, it was this snowball effect, uh, where page after page would, would kind of jump on and repost and it, you know, it would just keep kind of growing, um, the, the success of this video. And so basically what it was is there's this really, I won't say famous, it's a locally famous event. So like in San Diego, if you're a photographer, you most likely know about this happening, but it's called Scripps Henge, uh, which basically is, you know, a henge is a reference to Stonehenge, which, you know, if you know about Stonehenge, it was specifically designed with the equinoxes to align with the sunset uh, at different times of the year. And so, you know, there's kind of these henges all around the world where, structures will align with the sun or the sunset or sunrise at different times throughout the year. And so this, this one was in, uh, in, in San Diego and La Jolla, it's called Scripps Pier, hence Scripps Henge. And so, you know, twice a year, once in May, once in August, the sunset, you know, as it's coming down, will perfectly align down the end of this tunnel. And, and it looks really cool. Uh, and it's not like any other pier like most piers are kind of cluttered and busy but this one is like really minimal these concrete parallel um, columns you know that create this really fascinating like leading lines as you look down the from below in this tunnel uh, and so it's a really popular event I've known about it since I moved to San Diego but I was always I was always hesitant to go shoot it because you know, since it is so popular, there's these massive crowds that form every year. And there's, you know, basically dozens of photographers that are like piling together, trying to fight over, you know, the center shot <laughs> and everybody that everybody's trying to get. And so, you know, that wasn't really that appealing to me. I also don't love the idea of just kind of jumping on a trend. Um, but, uh, you know, I do like approaching things in, in a different way. And so I had a few ideas that, you know, I could approach this event and capture it in a way that I hadn't seen before. Um, and so, you know, specifically my idea was to, to have a more long lens shot and, and shoot it as a time-lapse. So, you know, it would be more of a detail of the sun kind of crossing through that window. Uh, but what's funny is, I have it in my calendar, right? I have some of these events in my calendar that that are on repeat every year. So it's like, hey, if it happens to be convenient for me and I see it in my calendar, I'll, I'll go check it out. Um, but year after year, I, it, well, it never really fit. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to bother or I'm too busy or whatever. Um, but last August, uh, you know, the same thing happened. I almost didn't go. I wasn't really going to going to go. But what's funny is I don't know if I've told you this or, or, you know, I didn't mention this in the, in the documentary either. Um, but I wasn't really planning on going. And then right around like four or 5 PM, my power went out at my house and I was working from home and I was like, well, I mean, there's nothing really to do now. I can't work anymore. And so that was like the catalyst that I was like, all right, screw it. Let's, let's go shoot Scripps Henge. Um, and so that was kind of the only reason I, I went out to shoot, which is kind of funny in retrospect. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I had an idea. I, I knew there was going to be a crowd. So my plan uh, was to bring my 10 foot tripod and a ladder. You know, that's something I use for my client shoots all the time. It's a really, really good way of getting, you know, nice elevation. Um and I, I figured, hey, I'll just be behind the whole crowd. You know, I don't care, you know, how many people are there. I'm just going to post up and be taller than everybody. Um, you know, long story short, that that didn't end up needing to happen because there was a there was such high tide that the crowd was pushed so far back. So there was no room for that. Um, but what I didn't know is there's this like concrete barrier in the back. And so I got there about an hour early and I was able to claim the middle spot right on this concrete wall. Um, you know, so I set up a two camera setup. Uh, of course, I've got to, you know, kind of multitask a little bit. One camera was at 600 mil. Uh, the other camera was at 70 mil, uh, both shooting time lapses. The interval for that one was like one second uh, frames. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think that that is what made it especially interesting is that it was, you know, kind of a slow setting sun instead of 
you know, a normal time lapse, you would shoot like five, maybe 10 second frames. You have um, all the light you'll need. You, that's for sure. Exactly. Exactly. And the light's not going to change that much, you know, but there was a few technical difficulties with it. Like, you know, knowing how to expose because you don't, you can't take test shots because you don't see the sun, you know, in that window until you, you, you're already shooting. Like you want to be shooting by that point. So you kind of have to guess, you know, what the exposure is going to be. I slightly underexposed for that reason. Um, and I mean, it just ended up being perfect. Like I, I got so lucky, like everything kind of fell into place. The, um, the weather is a thing that often screws this up. So, you know, even though it happens twice a year, many times it's too overcast or there's, you know, clouds on the horizon and you can't even see the sun at all. So it just basically doesn't happen. So like the weather cooperated, you know, the settings, I got really lucky. Um, there was actually a funny, uh, funny little, you know, aspect to it that people started to pile in and there's this angled concrete and people would, were trying to sneak in behind me. And it's like this, this concrete's all wet and it's got like bird poop on it. And so these people are like sliding down towards me and I'm on this little thin piece of concrete. Uh, and they came like inches from bumping my tripod and like screwing everything up. <laughs> uh, and I was like, uh, calm down. Uh, but luckily that didn't happen the alignment's only like five minutes long. So, you know, you, you, you know, but once my time lapses were shooting, I kind of was able to just enjoy, soak it in and, and just, you know, enjoy that moment, take some behind the scenes with my cell phone. Um, but anyway, really cool experience, uh, really special. We ended up getting a, a green flash, which I had never seen before. I've heard about uh, the green flash that happens at sunset. And I didn't even really notice it until I was looking closely at the time lapse and like zoomed all the way in, but there was a subtle green flash that happens. So it was kind of this, you know, this culmination of different things so that made things for a really right. Right. Exactly. Like everything just fell perfectly into place. Uh, and that's, you know, ultimately what made a mega viral video, um, you know, and I break down other aspects too, like the music and showing behind the scenes and, and why that's important. And it's an interesting story, right. That it's a rare event. So while you were shooting, did you ever have that thought of like, oh my gosh, this is going to blow up or how, how what, it, I, I know you talk about this in the documentary a little bit, but it started with TikTok, right? And then it kind of went from there. Yeah. I mean, that's, what's funny about what we do as creators and, and as artists, like you really never know, you never know what people are going to connect with, what content is going to hit the algorithm. And, and sometimes it's the things you wouldn't really expect. Um, and that's why you, you can't get too discouraged if something that you post, uh, isn't successful. Like I've had so many, uh, reels or videos or time lapses that in my opinion are way more impressive. You know, it's like, wow, I spent hours and days on this. And it's like, this is a masterpiece. I'm, I'm like, so proud of this. And then it just doesn't really hit, but you know, it's all, it's like timing comes into play. It's like, there's, there's all these factors. So you can't really, you know, be too hard on yourself. You just kind of, you just have to keep creating. Right. And so to me, this was just like another, you know, another shoot, another little time-lapse video I'd post probably get, you know, a couple hundred likes and be like, okay, move on to the next one. Um, but little did I know, like this, this was one that just happened to, to hit the algorithm and really pop off. And so, yeah, to your point, you know, the other thing that's interesting about it is you know, looking back and analyzing on it, you know, it, it went viral, the most viral on tick or sorry, on, on Instagram. So eventually, you know, by the end it had a hundred million views. And so, you know, it looks like, oh, well, Instagram is, is where, you know, it was successful. But when you, when I kind of backed up and, and analyzed and, and took a closer look at it, um, at, you know, the series of events, it, it's actually much more nuanced and interesting than that because the reason it went viral is because I, I cross posted at the same time, you know, which is pretty common. I'll throw it on, throw it on Instagram, throw it on TikTok, kind of forget about it. Um, I don't really take TikTok that seriously, but I figure like if I make a piece of content, it's not that hard to just post it to a couple of different platforms. 
And in this case, I'm really, I'm glad I did because that is actually where it first caught its wave. Like TikTok's got, you know, crazy algorithms that are much better for discovery for small creators. Like I had less than a thousand followers and, you know, within a day it blew up to like million, a million views on TikTok. And so that's actually where these bigger pages like complex, they were the first ones to, to pick it up and they found it on TikTok. And then they brought it back to Instagram and posted it there. So it kind of, it, it created this second wind uh, for the video on Instagram. And so, and then it, be, you know, like I said, it became this snowball effect where all these other big pages, Earth Picks, Puberty, Beautiful Destinations, all these massive pages were, were kind of jumping on the trend and, and picking it up and reposting it. And so that's what, what ultimately caused the Instagram post to, to blow up, uh, which is just really funny to, to kind of look back on that. The only reason it went viral on Instagram is because I posted it on TikTok, which I don't, you know, I don't really care about my audience. There is not that I don't care about them, but I mean, that's a whole nother story, but I don't think an audience as, on TikTok is as valuable. At least that's what I've found. Um, I don't think it's like as a gen more genuine connection. It's kind of, you know, people kind of follow on a whim. Um, but it's just interesting that, you know, posting it there, cross posting uh, benefited my Instagram page uh, dramatically. Do you happen to know any numbers offhand of what you're currently up to? And is it still getting play? Um, last I, I kind of stopped counting after it hit a hundred million. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, I was, I was watching it. It was like getting closer and closer. Like it paused at like 99.8 <laughs> and then finally, you know, finally it crossed that hundred million point. And that was like a really big milestone. Um, and that's just my own version of the video. Like if you count all the other pages that reposted it and the amount of views they got, you know, it's easily 250 quarter of a billion views. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of stopped counting after that. Um, but what, what I have found interesting in the whole process is, you know, kind of seeing, well, not only what kind of traffic that brings to your page when something goes that viral, right? So, you know, I was getting thousands of followers a day. Um, I jumped from 4,000 to 35,000 followers in, in, you know, less than a month. Um, and that was really cool. You know, I, I had a bunch of traffic to my website. I was selling, uh, the most prints I've ever sold in a short period of time. So I sold, you know, 50 to a hundred prints of that, of that event, um, of the scripts hinge, which I think is another, you know, it's really interesting. Like a lesson in going viral is like really being prepared for it and, and knowing how to kind of react when it happens. And so what, what I think really benefited me is I didn't just post this time-lapse, like, you know, here's, here's where the whole multitasking thing really proves to be uh, beneficial is because, you know, not only did I shoot that time-lapse with the main camera, but I had a secondary camera on the side and, and that one I was shooting, you know, I created some other stills. And so from this one shoot, uh, this one photo shoot at Scripps Eng, you know, I came home with maybe three to five um, images that I, I was really proud of and that I could sell as prints. Um, and so, you know, because this video went viral, I, I sort of cross promoted my print shop people, you know, were like, Oh, I, I like this. I connect with it. I want to remember this. I want this, a piece of this in my home. And so, you know, then they could go to my shop and see some like different images or prints of the script Sange event that weren't necessarily the time lapse, but it it relates to it. It tells the same story, um, and so I think that was that was kind of an interesting learning experience. Uh, and, and it was it paid off to be you know kind of prepared for that moment when I had all this influx of traffic to my website, um, and I was ready. You know, I it happened to be a slow time, a little bit slower for my my client work, so I I could handle those orders and and getting a bunch of prints made. Um, but it, you know, it, it only, it lasted like a month and then it, it sort of fizzled out, which is another interesting thing too, like learning that, you know, your moment in the spotlight isn't, isn't going to last forever. It kind of, it kind of comes in a big, big wave and then it, it slowly fizzles out. 
And another thing too is, you know, you 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 would think that thirty thousand follower new followers would be this like enormous jump in engagement, uh, and it was a little bit at first. But one thing I find interesting is is it it doesn't really directly translate to like loyal followers. You know, most people just kind of press the plus follow button on a whim uh, if they see a viral video, and you know, uh, part of it's you know, short attention spans, but part of it's also like the algorithm to blame. Like it's not showing all those 35,000 people, my newest work. Uh, so that was, that was kind of a learning experience as well. Um, that, I mean, there's definitely a handful, like there's a, a really solid chunk of people who are now like loyal supporters, you know, they, they want to follow my journey. You know, they've, they've watched me on, on social media and, and see my new work. But it's not like all of them, you know, it hit these other countries like India and Spain, and it kind of had these waves in different countries. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to see like how that can tangibly, uh, you know, create new new customers and new new fans, and new followers. Is it something you're now like actively pursuing or thinking about now that you've gone through it, how to kind of do that again? Yeah. I mean, it's so hard to predict what's going to go viral. Like there's, there's things that, um, I thought would, or I want to, but, but don't. And it, it's really hard to, you know, to force something to go viral. Um, but there is, you know, there is like somewhat of a, a recipe and I, I've kind of learned that. And I broke it down much, you know, much more deeply in that, that video you mentioned, um, but you know, there's little things like, I think the, um, I think the emotional connection is huge. And so I don't, I, I think there's no way my video would have gone viral if I only posted the time-lapse itself. Like, I, I just think that's, that was a, a big learning experience for me. It's like, the only reason it was successful is because I, I introduced the time-lapse with a behind the scenes clip. Uh, you know, of me behind my camera, you see this massive crowd of people all like waiting with their cameras. Um, and that, you know, supported the story. It, it made, it gave context to what people were seeing. Cause if you just see a sunset happening through, you know, a couple pillars, it's like, okay, <laughs> like, I don't get it. Sure. Cool. A sunset. Um, but, you know, I, I put the text on screen. I say, you know, Hey, here's uh, this rare event that only happens twice a year and photographers gather for in the audio. Like you can hear uh, this lady, like scream at someone walking by, like get out of the way. And so there's all these like little moments and there's like someone, some grandpa with an iPad. So like these things that, that just make it like a topic, a topic of conversation. And I think that's really what propelled its success is that there were so many angles to look at this from and so many things that people could talk about uh, and discuss. Yeah, so like you I, mentioned the, uh, the the DVD thing. Yeah. Like who right. would have made that connection? I never would have thought of that. Yeah. People were commenting about the DVD, you know, logo bounce in the corner or the reference to that. People were commenting on, um, you know, the green flash, the fact that it looks like it's like melting egg yolk. Um, you know, they were commenting on how ridiculous it is that, that all these photographers are trying to capture the same shot and like, you know, criticizing that, you know, why would you want the same shot? Why would you want to, you know, pile into this group of photographers that looks awful, like all very fair, understandable crit critiques. It's like, okay, like I get that. It's not for everybody. Um, but I think, you know, just having things to talk about and, you know, creating an opportunity for discussion and things that relate to anyone around the world. Like, even if you're not from there, it doesn't matter. Um, people were chiming in with their opinion. Um, so even if it's like, I, I, you know, even if it's controversial, I feel like that might be more uh, reason something has potential to go viral. Cause like comments, you know, are, are a major factor in what's going to drive uh more people to see a video. It's so funny. Yeah. It's, it, I didn't, it's great that you have that 
period of reflection after the fact to realize that like mm -hmm. the shot itself there's a there's a bunch of photographers they're getting the same shot so for you yeah. it was the story behind the shot that really mm -hmm. connect with people and that's uh i guess something that i should think about more and other photographers or aspiring yeah. photographers can focus on yeah i mean you gotta love it you really you gotta love what you do and uh you gotta do it out of passion and, and not you know you can't expect everything to go viral or to be successful like i was saying before you gotta you gotta kind of be convicted in your love of it and that's enough you know that's got to be enough and then it, you know that eventually will show you know eventually people will recognize that and uh you'll find the right audience uh how can people follow you and, and learn more about your work yeah um pretty much every page of mine is alex nye art a-l-e-x-n-y-e-a-r-t uh that's my website alex .com, on instagram at gmail <laughs> is my email if you want to hit me up um tiktok is the only one that's different that's nye's eyes i mean i really appreciate you coming back on and uh yeah you were one of the very first ones the, in the first round and so i knew i wanted to have you back on and we could do that we could do this like quarterly you know what i mean oh man there's so much to so much to dive into like i feel like we hardly scratched the surface i mean i want to hear about what you're doing as well um but yeah always good to catch up man you too all right well thank you again and uh for the listeners in the uh in upcoming episodes of the creative truth i'm going to be talking to more artists entrepreneurs and creative professionals if you have uh, episode feedback or guest suggestions you can email me at we at gmail.com uh if you're listening on itunes please leave us a five-star review if you're watching on youtube please don't forget to like share subscribe ring the bell um exciting stuff coming down the pipeline thanks for listening we'll see you in the next one